How are you guys doing? Great! I'm going to be talking about sex today. Whoa! Whoa. Yeah. Either you're all going to go, I'm out of here, or I'm going to hear this. Um, all those who are frustrated, can you come on, come on up? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hello? I lost it? No more, okay. Okay, so would you mind if it's at all possible to, uh, if you're uh, just standing around, have a seat. It's uh, to create as much, rem you know, as much uh, settling as possible. So uh, if you're, uh, if, especially if you're a volunteer, if you're, instead of staying, sitting around, standing around, you can sit. I would very much appreciate that. I am totally serious. I'm going to be preaching on the top, uh, topic of sex. The, uh, the title of the sermon today is The Beauty of Sex. Okay? I, I heard about this older couple who heard a sermon on sex from Proverbs. I'm going to be preaching from Proverbs today, uh, where the passage says, May you rejoice in a wife of your youth. And so... Uh, they were talking about the sermon as they were in bed that evening, and the wife said, you know, when we were young, you used to come close to me and cuddle with me. And so he came close to her and cuddled with her. And then she said, well, uh, when we were young, you used to hold me tight. And so she came, he came and, and held her real tight. And, and then she says, well, when we were young, you used to nibble on my ear. And then he just kicked his blanket, got out of bed, and walked over to the bathroom. And she was a little hurt by this. And, and she said, well, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, if you want me to nibble on your ear, I better go get my teeth. <laughs> uh, that's all right. Anyway, if you're here for the very first time, welcome to Love LA. You joined us on a, a fun Sunday. Now, I, I, I know some of you are thinking, oh man, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to like this sermon because obviously the, the dude is a Christian. He's going to tell me not to do it. Condemnation is the last thing I need. I want to ask you to hold your conclusion and hear me out, all right? And hear me out fully, the whole story. I, I think, really, there are two major views on sex right now. We, we have the secular, biological sort of view of sex, that sex is an instinct, and as long as we don't hurt anyone, we should go and do it, you know? If we're hungry, we should go eat. If we're thirsty, we should drink. Uh, so if we're, you know then we should go have it, you know, that, that, that's the view, that there, there is a lot of people who think that way. And then there are some people who uh, have a fairly moralistic view of sex, and, and that sex is dirty and it leads to sin if it's not sin, and it's definitely not spiritual, so we should try to avoid it. You know, actually, you might be surprised to find that this is not the biblical view of sex. Biblical view, the biblical view of sex is not biological, secular, but it's not moralistic either. The gospel shows us a third way. So let's start off by reading a Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 to verse 20, I believe that that is printed in your bulletin, so if you can read, me, read with me. It says this, Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in public squares, let them be yours alone, never be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a gra graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always, May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace 
the bosom of a wayward woman. It, you know, the Bible has stuff like this, right? I mean, like, let her, may her breath satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Pretty, um, it, you know, it's pretty much, pretty out there. Let's read one more proverb. Proverbs 11.22. Like a gold ring in a pig snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Whew. As we work through uh, the, the sermon today, here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about, number one, the beauty of sex. Number two, how, we made, how you and I made it ugly. And three, the power to fix it. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So let's start out with the first topic, the beauty of sex. So we just read in uh, Proverbs, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breath satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. And this is a beautiful expression of the beauty of sex. I, I, I actually never heard this passage read at Young Knock, <laughs> you know, Young Knock Church, that this is from, I, I never heard that, I, I never saw it before, they never taught, yeah, it's the mother church that sort of funds this thing. Uh, the, the Bible, however, is pretty open about sex, you know, it actually talks about it pretty often. In fact, there's a whole book in the Bible about sexual relationships, did you know that? It's called Song of Songs. It's really sensual, it's very erotic, and let me give you a case. All right, this is PG-13, possibly R. Uh, listen to this poetry in the Song of Song uh, 4, referring to his experience on the wedding night. He never knew that the Bible has actual poetic description of a wedding night experience. But here it is, okay? Your lips drop sweetness as a honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Lebanon must be great. I've always talked about Lebanon. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices. You are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. Now, uh, what do you think this garden is referring to? What, what do you think these plants and, and incense and spice and fruits and fountains, the, the wells are referring to? Well, I don't, I don't think I have to really say it. It's, it's talking about that, you know, thing. <laughs> the, thing. <laughs> the, the, the point is, I'm trying to make it as rated PG as possible, all right? Love. So, so stay with me, stay love. with me. So, so the point is that the Bible actually celebrates sex. But you know, the church has not always taught this correctly. Um, the church has been influenced on by some wrong philosophies regarding this. Um, Saint Augustine, you guys have heard of a guy named Saint Augustine? Yeah. He, he was one of the greatest theologians of the church around the fourth century, and his theology still influences the church today. In the realm of sexuality, he had uh, a, a critical impact on the theology of the church. But I think he was somewhat influenced, and, and, and stay with me, this is a little philosophical, okay? He was somewhat influenced by Plato's view than the biblical view. See, Plato, you remember, you, know, you heard of the philosopher, Greek philosopher named Plato, right? His view was, he talked about a lot of different things, but one of the things that he said is that immaterial things, or the arena of the spirit is good, but material things, things that you can touch and feel and smell and do, the material thing, the arena, uh, of the physical is bad. So spiritual good, physical bad. And so that's what Plato's, uh, Plato taught. And so sex fell into the arena of the physical, so it was only tolerated for procreation, to have babies. But this is not the correct biblical view. In, in, in Christ, God, the 
spiritual, the immaterial became physical, right? See, in Christianity, we don't, we don't say material things are bad, spiritual things are, you know, immaterial things are the spirit, only spiritual things. We don't do that. We believe that God, who is immaterial, became physical. Amen. So we don't divide spiritual and physical as good and bad. Physical can be good because God became physical. But the church has been influenced by this Plato's thinking. So between the 3rd and 10th centuries, the church issued edicts to forbid husbands and wives. We're not talking about just other people out there having sex on their own. We're talking about husbands and wives. The church forbid forbid husbands and wives from having sex on Thursdays because that was the day that Jesus was arrested. And then they and then on Friday, because that was the day of his death, and then on Sundays in the remembrance of the saints, and eventually the church said, well, during the 40 days of Lent, which is the 40 days before Good Friday, you shouldn't have sex. And then they said, well, the 40 days of Advent, before 40 days before Christmas, you shouldn't be having sex. And then during the 40 days of Pentecost, you shouldn't be having sex. And they, they, they added up so many fast, you know, sex fast days um, and holidays uh, to, the, to the list that if you add them all up, you have 44 days to have marital sex. You, but I don't love you enough to commit to get fully naked with you in every other way. It's not that God doesn't want us to have fun. He says that if you don't use it the way it was intended to be used, you'll break it. It'll break your heart. And you'll break her heart. You'll break his heart. If you use sex in a way it was designed to be used, it strengthens your one flesh union, your marriage. Sex is a commitment tool. It seals your commitment only if you use it in that context. Otherwise, you lose the ability to commit. But if you use sex not in a way it's designed to be used, it's going to hurt you and it's going to hurt your partner. If sex meant something to you in a relationship and when that relationship is broken, you lose a little bit of yourself. People say, well, you know, I'm not hurting anyone. But the scripture says sex is, in a way, it's like two cardboards, corrugated cardboards being glued together. And when you separate the two, you have bits and pieces of the cardboards on the other. There is pain. And if sex didn't mean anything, to you and you just segregated giving your heart and life from the physical act of sex, then when you come to a relationship, when you do want to give your soul and heart, how are you going to make the act of sex, which meant really nothing to you, how are you going to make this a meaningful act suddenly? You are not going to enjoy it. You're going to use it at a very superficial level of pleasure. And how are you going to change that? So that's the second reason. Because sex, as God designed it, is a one flesh union, an act that glued people together as one. It's meant to be done in a context of marriage because it's meant to seal a total union and not just one kind of a union. And to use it as a one kind of union is hypocrisy. So number three. Sex is beautiful because it shows us Christ's love for us. Okay, this is the more theological arena, so stay with me. Because New, New Testament often compares the relationship between husband and wife with the relationship between church and Christ. So for example, in Romans chapter 7, verse 1 to 6, Paul says the relationship between husband and wife is like the relationship between Christ and the church, just as when a woman puts herself literally in the arms of a man, fruit comes. If you put yourself in the arms of Christ, then we bear fruit. And, and this analogy is very intimate and sexual. Uh, you know, ecstasy and joy of sex is a foretaste of the intimacy that we will experience with Christ. Sex is an invented by God to give us a foretaste of what is to come. Foretaste of the ecstasy we will experience when we see Christ face to face. 
ways and enter into a union with him. Sex is a signpost. It is an analogy. It is a way to try to show us what we are after. The Bible is constantly trying to tell us that it is what it, what it is really like when the new heavens and new earth is established, when the kingdom of God, when the kingdom of heaven is fully established. And it uses sex as an analogy of heaven. It's that beautiful. The biblical view of sex is really higher than any other view of sex. It's a glorious view. But we took this beauty. We took this beauty and made it something ugly. And that's my second point. C.S. Lewis, the guy who wrote Chronicles of Narnia and stuff like that, he uses this analogy. Imagine you go to a country, right? And you're not familiar with it. You're, you're a visitor to this country. And, and, and when young men go to college, they put up a wall-sized pictures of food all over their room. Big pictures of food. And they'll, they'll just say, wow, look at this one. And, and people just look at those pictures and they drool over it. And, and, and sometimes they go to a club and everybody's hanging around the stage. And it's a little bit dark and the music beats in a pulsating way. And, um, and, and the music is seductive and they slowly unveil a hot dog. What, what, what would your conclusion be? You're a visitor to this country and that's how they live. Well, well, you know, you must be asking, are they starving? Is that what's going on? They're so hungry that when they see food, they, they just go, oh man. I mean, they, are they hungry? But you find that that is not true. A few years ago, Dr. Sigman said, we, sh we don't eat enough food. So people have been eating like crazy in this country. The only conclusion that you can really come to is that this country must be deeply messed up about food, right? I think we are deeply messed up about sex in this world. It's hard to see how we can get our standard or even wisdom from the world about sex. I mean, think about it. Where are you getting your values about sex? Where are you getting your ethics about sex? Are you just completely ignoring what God has to say? And you're going to get your ethics from this messed up world? Is it just because, well, that guy's doing it. She's doing it. Boy, I saw it on the TV. Everybody seemed to be, is that where we're getting our ethics about sex? And you're saying, that's okay? Don't you see how messed up this world is regarding this? I think Proverbs 11.22 is a good picture of our society's view of sex. This is the one that says this, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. I can't help but to smile when I read that verse. I think Bible is so funny. <laughs> We made something beautiful into something ugly. 1 Thessalonians 4.2 says that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in a passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. We as followers of Jesus Christ are called to a different standard. You know, the word here for lust in Greek is this word, epithumia. Epi means like over, super, like epicenter, you know, super. That, you know, that, that's what it means. And, and, and thumia means desire. So it literally means over desire. There are lots of things in which it is good to desire. But if you super desire a good thing, if you over desire something, it becomes an idol of your life. Idols are not always going after bad things. There, there are also good things that we over desire. A job is a good thing. A house is a good thing. Uh, a, 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 an apartment with a kitchen is a good thing. A family is a good thing. Uh, marriage is a good thing. Physical beauty is a good thing. And sex 
is a good thing, but if we over desire these things, these things, it becomes an idol. And that's what idols are. They, they look good on the surface, but slowly they replace Jesus as our Savior. We look to something else as our Savior, and that's what idols are. And they become false lovers of our heart and seek to deplace the one who should be our one true love above all else. But they have no mercy if you fail. If you don't live up to the idol, they crush you as a failure and they never deliver on success because enough is never enough. They hurt you, they hurt your family, they hurt your relationship with God. By pursuing your idols, you're saying to God, Jesus is not enough. I, always, I also need sex outside of marriage to be happy. See, idolatry is often what drives us. Because we think, if we had that, we'll be happy. See, it's only Jesus, only the Spirit of God can give you what your heart is yearning for. See, in some ways, instead of sex being a way to communicate absolute oneness and unity in the context of a personal relationship, we, we a lot, lot of men here, we made it into a conquest. I was at a store, and, um, I, and I couldn't help overhear this conversation between two guys on the phone. And, and one guy was telling other guy about the sexual conquest of his co-worker, and he was married, and so he was talking about that conquest, and, uh, and the other guy was just like congratulating him, uh, and then talking about how great it was, congratulations man, that's awesome man, it was, it was just so messed up listening to this conversation. I think if we guys have to get a woman to sleep with us to get our sense of wealth, get our sense of worth and power, you know, that's pretty pathetic. It's sad because if you don't get it, you're going to feel like a loser. And if you do get it, you're going to feel like you're somebody based on a conquest, based on hurting people. I mean, that kind of pride is deeply messed up at so many different levels, I can't even say. Sex, as a way to affirm ourselves, I'm desirable. In fact, we use sex to tell us that we are wanted and accepted. It's a lonely world out there, and we long for the touch of a woman or a man. And some of us are so afraid to say no for the fear that the person will leave if we refuse to have sex, and so we end up appeasing the other person through sex and while doing so we lose the beauty of sex and it just becomes a bargaining chip in a relationship and that's also very sad and for some of us sex is an addiction you can't help but to have sex when you date somebody you go out on a date that's how the evening ends it's just what you do it's a natural thing to do you don't want to do it, but you feel like you can't help it. It's like a drug. For many of us, it may not be sexual intercourse, but pornography as an addiction, or just lustful eyes as, as an addiction. I, 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 it's part of how we pervert sex. I think almost all guys, I venture to say that almost all guys in here struggle with this thing, and if you don't, you're just lying to me. <laughs> Sorry. Whether we're in a relationship or not, we struggle with this. And often our girlfriends, our wives, or any, if we are in a relationship, they don't even know that we do any of these kinds of stuff. The point here is that we took something very beautiful and messed it up and we're addicted, we're, we're controlled by it, we use it as a conquest, we use it as a way to feel like we're somebody. I mean, it, sex has just become a tool to say, hey, look at me. So what do we do about this? 
Where is the power to fix it? Where do we get the power to actually change ourselves? See, the gospel leads us to the realization that God's standard is really high. You know, one of the ways that we often, and I get this from people all the time, how far can I go before I sin, Pastor? I mean, it's, it's, I don't think that's the right question, but many of us, we, we just have this, like, can we lower the standard a little bit so I can appease God with it and not feel guilty about it? Can we lower the standard? But Jesus comes around and goes, you have heard that it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman with a lustful eye, you have already committed adultery. Boom! I mean, the guy is like raising standards up through the roof. It makes everybody guilty. I used to feel righteous until Jesus said that kind of, you know, feeling, right? I mean, Jesus is raising the standard, and he's taking this pretty seriously. And consistently through his disciples and apostles, he has set a very high standard that we ought not to be engaged in sex outside of marriage. And we ought not to even be engaged in lustful behavior or lustful thought. Amen. So you know what that leads us to? We must acknowledge our failures. We must acknowledge our own messiness. We need to say that to one another. We need to confess our sexual sins to one another. But you know, it's not just the behavior of the sin that we need to confess, but we need to go to the sin beneath the sin. Well, why is it that we do this? Why do I do this? Maybe I'm doing it because I want to feel loved. And it's just a way of seeking that. Maybe we're doing it because there's a, there, there's a sense of powerlessness and addiction going on. Maybe we're doing it because we're just afraid that nobody would love us if we don't. Or maybe we're doing it just purely out of physical frustration and we feel like, you know, our body has completely taken control of us and we have no power to overcome whatever our body desires. Or maybe we're just doing it because we're, we're seeking after an idol and we think this will help us get to that idol, that which will provide me with happiness if I just do this. See, I think we need to confess our sins, that we have used sex to gain approval from people, that we have used sex to get, get affirmation from people, that we have used sex to feel like we're somebody, that we have made an idol out of sex, or, 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 or something like that. We, we must acknowledge that, that we do not have the power to overcome this on our own. It's like 12 steps. You have to acknowledge your powerlessness. You have to acknowledge that you and I are all more messed up than we can imagine, particularly in the area of sexuality. We are. I'm not here to just give you the bad news, but I'm also here to give you the good news. That God loves us more than we can ever imagine. You know, John the Baptist called us to repent, right? And then you know what happened after people repent? You know what he said? He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He calls us to behold and gaze at and look at the Lamb of God. That God the Creator came down in flesh and actually became the one who died for our sins. The one who was killed for our sins. The one who was crucified for our sins. Including the sins of our sexual mess. That Jesus has taken a hold of that and he has died for us and behold the Lamb of God. And then you know what John the Baptist said after that? He said, Jesus, this one who is to come after me, the Messiah, Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He says, I baptize you in water, which is a baptism of repentance, but I, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You see, he is saying 
that once we come to grips and gaze at the atoning sacrifice through Jesus Christ and forgiveness that comes through him, when we walk in to a relationship with the Father, that even though we're messed up, he embraces us, he loves us, he engages us, and he fills us up with his presence. You know, you know what it means to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? I know it means a lot of different things, and people talk about about the technical meanings of all of those things, but the heart of everything is that the presence of God, the love of God is coming down on you and soaking you. That's what it means. That it's baptism is this word to immerse, to saturate you, that the love of God saturates you and that you are embraced by God's love in your life. And the more you experience and live in that love of God, the more you don't need a conquest to feel like you're somebody. Because you already are somebody because he took a hold of you and loved you and said, you're my son in whom I am delighted. So you stand on the righteousness that he has given to you. And so you don't need to do the act in order to feel like you're loved because you're already loved by Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit you're soaked in his love and when you live in that world when you live in in, in, in the love of God dancing with God delighting in God you know you, you begin to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know what it means to live by the Spirit? If you look at Galatians, it says, if you live by the Spirit, you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. You know what fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If you want self-control, you got to live by the Spirit. You got to be whacked by the Spirit in a good way. You got to be filled with the Spirit. You got to be baptized with the Spirit. You got to just enjoy this relationship with God that He is leading you to. And the more you enjoy the delight of the fullness of the ecstasy of this relationship with God, God, the more you don't need that other crap. The more you don't need that other crap. And the more you have the power to overcome and actually live according to the standard that God has called us to live. And sometimes it's hard work. You, you make some decisions. As you live in the presence of God, you make some decisions, you have accountabilities, you have software protections, you, whatever you do, you, you're going to protect it. You're going to put yourself in the context of community who keeps, your, who keeps you accountable to the standard and the lifestyle that you want to live. No more compromising, no more saying, oh, whatever everybody's doing. No more of that crap. You're going to say, I am going to live according to the standard that God has called me to live because he called me to live by the Spirit and gave me the power to live by it. The more we delight in the presence of God, the more we have power to actually live according to the beauty of God. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer.